Hey y'all, welcome to another video on my channel. Today's video is going to be Nick Ferguson presenting on fodder trees, discussing coppicing and pollarding trees and the benefits and drawbacks of each. Uh, this discussion was had at the Survival Podcast Workshop spring of 2021. And I hope you enjoy it. If you do, don't forget to like the video and subscribe to my channel and see more great content coming in the future. Thanks a lot. Not sure if you know this or not, but there's actually another great website for videos that doesn't deal with a lot of the censorship that you deal with on YouTube. If you're interested, and it's a favor to me, please go over to odyssey.com and subscribe to my channel there as well. Uh, you'll find the link in the description below. Thanks. Give you the master of fodder trees, the man who can make a leaf into a protein source for an animal, Nick Ferguson. All right. No, that's good. All right, good news of fodder trees. I'm going to try and make this relatively brief. I just want to show you all what, what they look like. Because when I describe it, it's one thing, but actually seeing a picture is another thing. So I'm going to go over a couple things kind of briefly. Fodder is, you know, kind of like the human fund, money for people. This is leaves for animals. Um, I think they're just, are they, uh, the difference they're is yeah, coppice. When you coppice a tree, yeah, so it's cut down low, here. generally at the ground level or about four inches off the ground. You want a stump, and I'll show you some pictures of those stumps. Pollards are cut up high. Generally, the reason being is you're trying to get up and away from the browse and uh, of, of deer and sheep, goats, cattle, any kind of herbivore that's going to eat those very yummy, tender, sugar-filled, high-protein leaves. So they all want them, and if you cut it down to the ground and you're managing it as a coppice, then you might have problems with just wild browsers coming in or your livestock coming in and damaging your trees. So that's the difference between the, the two. Uh, there we go. Why should I care? Um, if you like the idea of being independent from a feed store, you need to be able to feed your animals. If you cannot feed your animals, you're going to be dependent upon the feed store, which means you're dependent upon your income, which means you're dependent upon the sourcing of the feed from the feed store. If they can't get it, are you going to be able to get it? No, which is why we built this fodder system for ducks, which is why I, I advocate for fodder systems for your herbivores as anything that will eat a leaf. Uh, it's tried and true. This has been done for millennia, literally. Some of the first evidence that we have is 4000 BC. That's a long dang time. Um, it's high protein feed. There we go. It's high protein feed. It's practically free. All it requires is just a tiny bit of your time to harvest it. And actually, if you design smart, you can have the animals harvest most of it for you. People set up blocks of coppice in basically like a paddock. Treat it like a pasture. It's rows of trees that are bush hogged every winter, so they're cut down four inches off the ground every winter, and they suck her up, and you can grow these rows of trees that the animals, you let them into that paddock, they just harvest it for you. You don't have to touch it. That's pretty dang easy. Um, money. I don't like my money leaving my control. The more money that I keep, the more money that I can control, the more money that I can um, put to work for me, the wealthier I become. Some people say money doesn't grow on trees. Diamond Dave says, no says I, it's basically high protein feed, it's basically free. Money is, in my opinion, my understanding, essentially embodied energy. It is a symbol that we as a society have used collectively to exchange 
our time and energy. You don't get money, unless you steal it from someone, unless you trade it. You trade your time and your energy and your effort for either a good or money that you can trade. So it is almost essentially embodied energy. Um, time, you're, you're trading your time, energy. Time is money. Paycheck to paycheck, you can live uh, paycheck to paycheck and you're perpetually poor. I prefer to build wealth. Kind of the definition of wealth, correct me if I'm wrong, um, we've got some people here who probably know a little bit more about this than I do. It's your ability to meet your wants and needs without sacrificing your time and energy and effort. If you can meet those needs and you don't have a big mansion because you don't want one or you don't need one, are you, can you still be wealthy? If I'm, if I'm, if I get everything that I want and need, and I don't have to sell my soul to some, some fat cat in a high-rise penthouse suite, am I wealthy? Do I actually have to have billions of dollars to be wealthy? I say no. So, we always want to reduce our outgoing energy, and collect energy into our ecosystems, into our life, into our control, so that we can build that and become more and more wealthy. So what does it look like? Have you ever seen a crepe myrtle murder? You see those crepe myrtles that are just whacked off and they'll kind of develop these knobby, lumpy growths on the top? Um, have you seen those short, boxy trees that are kind of real square and they've got a real thick trunk and it's just this almost square top to them underneath power lines? power companies or the people that own the, the trees will come through and just top it and then it'll re-sucker out and grow. And multi-stem trees. Uh, you've got these really expensive crepe myrtles and um, birch trees that are multi-stem and you know it's a $250 tree that's two years old in a big pot that you sell to rich people and all it is is a coppiced birch or crepe myrtle. You cut it when it's really low, it sends out five or six little stalks, and you just train those up to be nice and pretty. That's a coppice tree. So here's what it looks like, essentially. We got a stump, and we got shoots coming out of it. It gets harvested down to a stump. It regrows and keeps going. That's a coppice. This is pollard. It looks exactly the same. One's just taller than the other. Really simple. This is kind of what a a coppice looks like when it's grown. We've got lots of growth here. We've got uh, first or second year shoots. We've got you know, five or six year old shoots that are making trunks. Here are some pollards. That looks kind of funky when it's, when it's you know, defoliated, but I'll show you some pictures of what it looks like when it's actually grown in and leafed out. So examples of pollarding. Here are some trees that have been pollarded. Tops are all whacked off. You got some actual, you can see the new shoots starting to form right there. Um, what happens is when these trees are cut like that, the, the cells around those, those lumps are what are called meristematic cells. They're basically the stem cells of the plant world. Those are undifferentiated cells that can turn into a leaf or a shoot or bark or a root, actually. Those stem cells are clustered in those areas. And when we whack that tree back, it sort of kind of resets its biological clock to a young tree. There are trees that are hundreds and I think actually thousands of years old that, or maybe a thousand years old, that are coppiced trees. And because they kind of have that biological clock reset, constantly, every single year, they get pretty old. Here's a, a picture of some trees. These are willows that are coppice but leafed out. The, I Pollard. think that looks pretty beautiful. Pollard, right? Pollard, Pollard, yeah. Did I say coppice? Yeah. yeah. Sorry. These are pollarded trees. Yeah. So here's another pollarded tree. As you can see, this one, the center is kind of starting to die out. This is one of the drawbacks to a pollard. Sometimes the center of the tree will actually start to rot out and then it'll get weak and it can break off and die. Oops. 
Um, this is some trees that have been pollarded for years and years. And you see these knobby clusters up there, full of those meristematic cells, ready to turn into tons and tons of shoots. Um, here's another one, very similar, but as you can see, it's been cut off. There's some flatter cuts here that it was probably let go for several years, and those, uh, those branches got really thick, and so they locked them off. I wonder if I can use this button. No. Here are some pollards that you can see the flat cuts on them. So they let them get, you know, pretty good diameter. So you don't actually have to do this every single year. You can let these pollards grow for several years and then cut them. But uh, I wanted to show you some before and after pictures. So these were cut. You cut them in the winter, as you can see, no leaves on the trees, they're dormant. You don't want to do surgery on a person when they're awake. Likewise, you don't want to do surgery on trees when they're awake. This is kind of what they look like after they send out shoots and grow in. These are actually probably second year shoots because this is early spring. But I just wanted to give you some pictures to show you what they look like. This is in the winter. These are cut a lot closer. This. The, now this is really cool. So, Japan. This is called Daisugi. You're not allowed, or you weren't allowed, to cut down these trees, but you could prune them. So what they do, they grow these trees as basically gigantic bonsais as a pollard, and they would let shoots, they would thin them out, so only one good shoot would come off of the other. So you'd get a perfectly straight piece of timber, and you could cut it, and then in just a few short years, way faster than you could have by planting a new tree because these shoots are drawing on all of the reserves of this massive root system. So they'll send up a ton of growth really fast and you get to harvest trees. It looks like pine trees growing on top of a shrub. Exactly. Except this is a, it's, you know, this is probably the size of a man right here. Yeah. That's the most expensive that lumber in the world. Tree. Yeah. That's one tree. That, yeah. That's the most, tree one tree. That, yeah, more they, than 20. That's the most expensive lumber in the world. Is it? That comes off that system in Japan. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. All right. Um, you don't have to pollard <laughs> six feet in, in the air if you don't want to. Some people will grow willow for weaving baskets because people actually buy baskets. Basket weaving is not completely useless. <laughs> these, are, these are willow grown for weaving baskets. And I zoomed up so you could see kind of a little bit better what they look like. And there's another shot of this one right here. It's just that gnarly, like a, a troll's club. All right, so we're going. Can you back up that one picture there? On that, since that's a willow, if you did this when they were fully leaved out, you could then take those stems because they root so easily and make you a little fence. Absolutely. You could actually take these cuttings during winter, like he is, take all of those and make a willow fence. How close would you plant them together? How close do you want to? It depends. What do you use? You could, you could, you could plant them. What are you using the winds for? Are you keeping in little chickens, ducks, pigs, whatever? You appropriate the holes. That's your close. It makes a living. All right. So, so you want to put right. So let's let's back up just a second. So let's say you want to grow a living fence. You could plant those six inches apart and plant them at an angle, and plant some more at an angle, and you could start weaving them together like chain link. Oh my God! If you wanted to. If you wanted to, like baskets, if you wanted to, you could actually take, and where those two are going to cross, uh -huh. this is a lot of work, but it's cool as hell. Yeah. Where those cross, you abrade the outer bark away so that the inner bark is exposed, the cambium. So you're carving it a little the, No, you don't carve it. You just take just a, the outer bark. a braid. The outer bark. It's with willow, the with willow, it's basically take... A utility knife that's dull and just so straight, straight. Yeah, 
<laughs> scrape, scrape. You leave the green, the green cambium, and then you do the same thing on the corresponding piece, and then take a little bit of grafting tape or uh, a strip of an old uh, grocery sack that you're gonna have to cut off later. Um, some kind of a oh, some yep some kind of a biodegradable twine. twine. Um, I, the weaker it is, the better because you want it to break down because you don't want to have to go out there and make five thousand cuts <laughs> to cut this stuff off. I'm about to ask a dumb question, but like if I try to be really precise and peel something off, I'll use sandpaper. You can absolutely use sandpaper. A block of sandpaper and just rub rub. Yeah. And ex yeah, all you're right. doing is exposing that right. cambium. If, if, if I'm leaving the green stuff, you know. Like I gotta be real careful with that razor. Correct, right? correct. You're not you're not cutting. You're just you know like this and just scraping. Yeah. It takes just a little tiny That's pressure. That's why it's dull. Exactly. That's why it's what dull. you do when you yeah. check to see if a tree is still alive. Exactly. Where you scrape off the outer bark and see if it's green underneath. That's it. So what's going to happen is when those contact those two pieces of cambium contact and you keep them snug together, I would say use grafting tape because it's going to biodegrade and break apart and not constrict and choke that and kill it. Hey Nick, a good, a good alternative too, if you have like old tiny hose, you cut them up and it would be, be great. Do women wear it, that anymore? Yes, except they don't biodegrade fast enough. It'll take three or four years for them to do that, and with these kinds of trees, they're normally very fast growing, and it'll choke the, the life out of them before it can break apart. Or it can embed in the, the bark, it'll grow around it, and then it's embedded, you have an avenue for insects and disease, we don't want to introduce vectors for death like that, if possible. Okay. That's why I say the grafting tape is super cheap. Just get some grafting tape, make a wrap over and wrap like that, and then pinch it off, and you're good to go. So it will graft together, and it will grow together, and they will actually meld their cambium one tree to another. So if you had tree number one, two, and three, and tree number two dies, it is only going to die up to the first graft. You're kidding. You can then rip that dead tree out, prune the dead away. You can take another little branch off of a willow, stick it in the ground, so it'll start rooting, and bend that whip up there, abrade it, abrade at the graft union, tie it to it, and it will graft into the fence and become a new little stump. So you can fill that hole. Now that stump isn't going to shoot off or do you have to like it just you, you will have to you'll have to prune stuff but it will if you let it go it'll just turn into basically an impenetrable you know given five or six years all that bark will grow that's together insane. and you'll have a wall o wood that's insane so how well did you do your job goats will actually be able to climb up that wall all right all right. Without the, the next, all right. Examples of coppice. Shake rule for other people. Right. So here's a coppice stump. They can be cut straight to the ground. Now it's better if you if you alternate years between taking big pieces off like this, so that it always has some green. So it's, you're not depleting the roots tremendously every single year. Generally, what would happen is in a historical usage of this system. You would take one, the biggest one, and then the next year you would take another one, and then the next year you would take another one. So in your system, with your tree species, with your fertility, whatever that that segment of time ends up being for the best size firewood for your situation, let's say it takes seven years to grow one shoot into a log that you want to harvest for whatever your purpose is. Then you would have seven shoots on a stump you would maintain seven. So that every year, you get to take one good piece, and it's growing the next year's piece, and the next year's piece, and the next year's piece, and you never run out, okay? So, you got a tree to be coppiced. It's ready to go. You cut close to the ground at the base in the winter. Shoots grow rapidly. It's ready to harvest, depending on your usage, depending on the tree species. Um, it could be between one year and 20 years. Generally, I mean, within 20 years, I mean, you could have a massive tree from a good established root system. So here's kind of the progression. You've got a stump. Next year, it looks like this. And the next year, it looks like that. If you let it go and you let it get really thick, 
then you're going to have a whole bunch of smaller pieces of wood. If you thin those out and only select one or two or three, then you're going to have one or two or three really big pieces. Here is some sweet chestnut. This is in England, in the UK, somewhere around there, on that island somewhere. They'll ha harvest these and then the next year they'll harvest another one. You see different sizes here. You've got more shoots coming up. Here's an old coppice. The center is rotted out, but you have big pieces coming up. This is actually a copse. I, I don't know who in here is literary nerds like me, but I find those old words interesting. A copse of trees, you know, you hear about. A copse of trees is, by definition, a coppice system. It's an acre or two or whatever that is harvested as a coppice system. That is a copse of trees. And normally they're really thick. And, and they, would, they would grow hazel because it grows really thick. It grows like a thicket. And you would harvest those hazel and that's usually fuel wood. You don't want to be splitting wood. You don't want to be sawing wood. You know, if you're talking about peasant living, you want to be able to take basically a big old brush axe and or an axe and give it one good thwack and cut a good stick off that's a good fuel wood size so that's how they would harvest that's what this that's what they look like here's an old coppice system that has been managed in several years this is a low-lying area it's got a lot of moss and stuff growing in there it's very thick This is some coppice regrowth on the hillside. This is probably an accidental, I can't remember where I got this picture from, but um, this is what it could look like. You can actually crop a hillside that's not, that's too steep and not appropriate for raising grass. And you could actually raise it with cattle or sheep or goats on much steeper land than you could otherwise and get higher yields out of it than you could have otherwise if it was just grass. Here's a, uh, an example of okay. a coppice system Sorry. used for forestry of timber. We've got probably 10 foot, 12 foot section of nice straight logs that are harvested and then regrown. And then in just a few years, you have more timber ready to go. Instead of clear cutting and then waiting 20 years, or your stupid loblolly pines to regrow like they do in Louisiana, you can be harvesting this um, in succession and you could actually take timber off of your acreage every single year. Here's another uh, example. You know, this is harvested with a chainsaw where you see some nicks in there and uh, it's really, really quick and easy. Oops. Here's, uh, here's someone harvesting hazel. So he's harvesting these staves for um, old-fashioned construction in the UK. They're weaving uh, wattle and daub walls. And this is what they used for, for their building materials and for, for fuel wood. Here are some racks drying. This is all coppice material. This is a really easy way to um, dry out your fuel wood. And then you just go out with the saw and you cut off chunks whenever you need it. Here's some more coppice trees. If you look carefully, you can see the stumps in here. Those are regrown. Here's some willow. These can actually be really ornamental and look great all winter long. So they'll grow thickly like that. And then uh, if you had several layers of this in between you and an ornery neighbor, that's a lot of, uh, a lot of leaf matter and a lot of stems help deaden noise and block sight. This is what uh, your coppice systems look like when they're allowed to just mature into an overstory canopy. That's it. Okay. Was Any questions? Yeah. I thought it was called crepe myrtle. No. Crepe myrtle. This crepe myrtle. Crepe myrtle myrtle. Crepe myrtles are trees. Trash. And if you want to follow the tree,